show. Now, if you're a dog lover like me, and yes, that's me and my dog, Khaleesi, she's so cute, then this is very familiar to you, right? We love our dogs so much, all of our pets. We let them lick us all over. It's, it's how they show their love. You all like this, right? But what you're about to see next may have you thinking twice. When I saw these headlines about amputations and even death from dog licks and bites, I needed to understand what's going on. Today we're investigating a medical mystery. How can a dog lick be deadly? And could you be at risk? You see it every day. Pet lovers playing with their dogs and letting them lick their hands and face. But beware, that playfulness could be deadly. A 58-year-old Wisconsin woman made headlines this summer when she was nipped by her puppy. Four days later, she was dead. Greg Mantefel's wife, Dawn, is grateful her husband is still alive. They think possibly the dog licked him and he touched his mouth or touched his eye. Within days of petting a dog, Greg's face began to turn black and blue. Doctors would later have to amputate his forearms and legs. Jack O'Neill went from this to this. He lost his legs, fingers, and part of his nose after his beloved Cocker Spaniel bit him. Robin Sullins was separating two family dogs who were roughhousing when she got nicked. Within 48 hours, she was in kidney failure. Experts say these infections from a dog or even a cat's saliva are extremely rare and can be hard to diagnose. But dog lovers like Robin say don't blame the dogs. This isn't about the dogs. This is a call for the medical community to be aware of symptoms when people come in. Angela and Chris Young agree. Their two-year-old son, Liam, had symptoms so severe that his legs and fingers had to be amputated. What caused this? For two and a half years, doctors had no answers. Liam's parents, Angela and Chris, are here. Angela, let me start with you. When did you first realize there was something wrong with your son? Um, back in October of 2015, uh, he had felt what we thought was the flu. So he ran a high-grade fever, had thrown up a couple times, and then two days later, his color changed and his liver and kidneys started to fail. Oh, so it was pretty fast. It was. It was 48 hours from the time that he started being sick until he was being med flighted. So we're going to show some pictures of your son. Uh, everyone, these images are a bit graphic, so just be prepared. Uh, but the, the reality of what happens sometimes. So what did the doctor say to you when you brought him in? Um, well, my husband. Chris. When I first took Liam to the emergency room, um, the ER doctor came in the room, Dr. Wack, and he said, I called for the helicopter to come up and get him from Iowa City. He's extremely ill. Um, we don't know what's wrong with him. All I know is we need to get him to Iowa City because we won't be able to treat him here. What's it like to not know what's wrong? It's the worst feeling in the world. I mean, Because you never know if it, when you don't have an answer as to what caused it, we didn't know if it was going to happen again. We didn't know if we could prevent it or anything like that. Was, was, Chris, was, was Liam around dogs frequently? Yes, he was. Um, we had a family pet named Freya, a boxer. Um, her and Liam were best friends, uh, as you can see from the pictures. Oh, yes. and they, they were inseparable. Did either of you ever sense that it could have been a dog? Did the doctors ever bring up the possibility that it could have been your pet that was responsible? We were in Liam's room in the pediatric intensive care unit when one of the specialists came in and said, we finally got something to show up in one of our blood tests, and what we had show up was capnocetophaga. Say but it again? Capnocetophaga. You, any of you ever heard of that before? I can tell you most doctors have it either. And we're going to talk and, about it in a second. And that's kind of exactly his response. Is This is the first time we've seen it show up in a person's blood work. We're running it again, and we'll let you know the results. Well, they came back in the room later and said, we didn't get it to show back up, so we're uncertain if that's the bacteria that caused his infection. Did, did you think your son would survive this? For the first 10 days, we didn't know if we'd walk out of the hospital with him. Um, and then as things started to slowly improve, things looked better, but for a while we didn't know um, 
he was in critical critical condition and they didn't know if he was going to make it. It's one thing to be at risk. It's another thing to be facing the unknown, mm -hmm. which is why after that many days you get into a spiral. So 78 days, that's it, 78 days in the hospital. That's how long they spent before Chris and Angela were finally able to take Liam home. But for two and a half years, what caused Liam's illness was still a mystery. How did you even begin to think that it might have been dog saliva? Well, considering that was one of the tests that uh, had first popped up that said it could have been a possibility for the capnocytophica. Um, however, nothing came back conclusive, so they said they weren't sure that's what it was. Chris? I remember receiving a message um, through my email from a lady that does gen uh, genetic testing, and she said, we've seen your son's case, and we're wondering if you would be willing to enroll him in this genetic testing because we have a theory that we think might be causing his illness. Um, so immediately we got him enrolled in that program. Actually, I got the letter that came with Liam's results in, because you're good enough to send along this information, which is great not just for Liam, but also because it can help us with other children, other adults. And here's what the letter says. I'm going to pull out one sentence. It says, we hypothesize that Liam has a genetic variant that predisposed him to capnocytophaga. That's a bacteria I'd never heard of before. So we're going to talk about it today because I think you all need to from now on. If the doctor doesn't know it, at least you should know it to remind us. So how's Liam doing today? Wonderful. He's doing well? He is uh, a spitfire of a five-year-old boy who, he is just like every other five-year-old boy. He jumps, he plays, um, everything's wonderful. He's just missing a few fingers and toes is all. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, he's wonderful. He's perfect. It's, he's perfect the way he is. He's perfect the way he is. You all want to meet Liam? Yeah, I thought so. Well, well you're going to get to meet Liam and the science behind a dangerous dog lick. So I'm going to talk about that when we come back. How safe is your family? I had my dog, Khalees, you just saw, tested for this bacteria. The results when we come back. Today we're investigating the medical mystery behind the shocking headlines. How can a dog lick lead to amputation and even death? And we just heard from the parents of a little boy who lost his legs and most of his fingers, and we're going to meet him in a moment. But first, how is this even possible? Well, it all starts with a specific bacteria in a dog's saliva. And what is this bacteria? How common is it? How often does it get spread to people? Dr. Casey Barton Bear Ravish is here to help. She's a senior veterinarian at the CDC's National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases. So please break this down for us. Sure, so what we're talking about is a bacteria called Capnocytophaga. In animals, it's very common. In fact, in dogs, 74% of dogs can carry this bacteria in their mouth. About 57% of cats can carry this bacteria in their mouth. And it's important to mention that these pets appear perfectly healthy and happy but can still be carrying a germ that has the potential to make people sick in rare cases. And what kinds of people are more likely to get ill from this bacteria that I've never heard of before? People who are more likely to get ill are those who have a weakened immune system. So for example, they might be undergoing treatment for cancer or have a disease like diabetes. Also people who've had surgery to have their spleen removed are more likely to become infected. And typical symptoms when someone gets infected, just so we can be alert to it? Sure, it can start off like anything else with you don't feel good, you have a fever, you feel kind of flu-like, but in one to three days, it can rapidly progress to serious illness where the bacteria gets in your bloodstreams. It can affect your organs and tissues and even lead to brain infection. This is pretty scary to me. You guys feel a little unquieted by this? We all love our pets. So let me, if I can, show you all how a dog lick or bite can become deadly. So dogs and cats normally have bacteria in their mouth, just like we do, by the way, right? And it's not harmful, usually. But if you look closely, there they are, the bacteria. Let's say you're out there playing with your dog and the dog scratches you by mistake or nips at you or, or even licks you, right? And then the bacteria gets into the skin, into your body through any opening. You might just touch your mouth and now it's in your blood. And once it's in your blood, your immune system usually fights off the bacteria, not a big deal. But if it can't keep up, sepsis can develop where there's complete loss of your blood pressure, your organs begin to shut down, you can't even get blood down to the limbs, which means the limbs begin to die. And when too much tissue dies, amputation may be needed, or even death can occur to you if the tissue dies too quickly. Now again, serious infections from this kind of bacteria are rare. 
So that's the case. Education is something that's important, but from what I can gather, most doctors, and again, I'd never heard of this, are probably like me. So to what extent is this, uh, is this real? And how much time do we have once someone has you know, touched their mouth after being licked, if they do get sick? Sure, this infection can have devastating consequences. I was trained as a veterinarian, and in veterinary school, we learned about this because it's a risk for us. We are at risk for being bitten and scratched by our patients, so it's important to know that we can get this. There is a need for increased awareness among the human medical community, and I'm very glad you're covering this on your show to get the word out. I, I bet you it's a small fraction of people, doctors know this, which is why we need all you to spread the word. And the smartest audience in television, if someone gets sick and we're not sure why, just ask this, but we'll come back in a second. First thing, I want to know how much of risk am I at my home? Because I've got the three grandkids running around, okay. a dog and a cat, right? So I'm curious if they had the bacteria. You said 74% of dogs have yes. it. Is Khaleesi one of them? So I, I actually had the vets come over to the house and had them test my pets. And then they sent the swabs. That, that's Khaleesi. That's baby cat there. Not, not just, she wasn't, he's not very happy with that, right? <laughs> and I have the results in my hand. I haven't seen them. So we're all going to find out together. Be supportive, guys. All right. Khaleesi came back negative. Oh, one in four dogs. I'm going to have to applaud her. <laughs> now, Baby Cat, who is the more mysterious of the pets, that's the, she came back questionable. She says she has a different kind of bacteria. They were worried about it, but it wasn't that kind of bacteria, which I'm good. I'm good to go. So what's important? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> What's important is that people should not be afraid of pets. Yeah. Animals, whether they're covered in fur, feathers, or scales, have the potential to sometimes carry germs that can make us sick. Capnocytophaga is one of those. Mm. And it's important to know that your dog might be negative today, but maybe you take her to a dog park tonight, she shares a toy with another dog, licks another dog, drinks out of a shared water bowl, she could become infected. So there's some simple things you can do to make sure you and your pet stay healthy. So if people are gonna protect themselves, they've got a couple action steps. First off, don't run away from your dogs. Dogs are actually very good for us. There are a lot of reasons besides the fact that you love them, they love you back. But babies that are in early contact with dogs and cats, 30% less likely to get colds. I wish we had a pill that could do that. So it's not bad to be around pets and once in a while get licked, usually. And I've got to say this, if you go to a hospital and there's some strange thing happening that resembles one of these infections you've been talking about, just tell the, the doctors, I've been around pets, I may have been licked. That's what you got to say, right? Simple, straightforward. <laughs> Seriously, you'll be surprised how simple clues like that dramatically change where we are. So to learn more about the CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People program, you go to DrOz.com. Dr. Casey, thank you very, very much. Thank Congratulations, you. Godspeed. Yeah. All right, now, audience, you all remember... Early we talked about Liam. Are you all ready to meet Liam? You wanna meet him? Right. Liam, come on out! Oh my! Can I sit over here? I'll sit next to Liam. Can I sit next to Liam? You can sit next to Liam. How are you? Good. Good. Are you excited to be here? Yeah. Now, I understand kindergarten's starting pretty soon for you. Are you excited? Oh, 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 jeez. I'm glad you did He's a five-year-old, all right. What do you got there for me? Oh, shit. Yeah. Hey, you hold this for one second. Um, I've got it. What, what does my shirt say here? It says, what does it say? The Liam Project. Oh, my goodness. Uh, skids, kid steers for kids. Good for you. And yeah. you really move around. Come on over here. Look at him go. You don't even need this wheelchair. And what is what is this? Can you tell is that, that yours? What that is? What is this? Uh, this is skid steer. What is it? Skid steer. It's a it's, skid steer. It's a skid steer. Are these guys all raising money to help you? Those are actually all the people that I work with on the line that build the full-size units. Um, we created a nonprofit called the Liam Project, and we raise money through the people I work with in different um, areas in the community, and we donate those to different hospitals throughout the Midwest for the children and patients. Good for you. Turn it off. You should be very proud of your parents because they're proud of you. 
Enjoy kindergarten. He's going to raise hell there. It's good for oh, him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Mm. You're an amazing little boy. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss out on new videos to live the good life.